Hello, hello. I'm Nick. And I'm Helena, and we both work here at the MS Trust, a charity for people affected by MS in the UK. And we are here to help you make sense of MS. Yeah, and thank you so much for listening. You're listening to Multiple Sclerosis Breaking It Down, which is our podcast, where we aim to bring together lots of different voices, lots of lived experience from the MS community. And we're going to talk about all different aspects of life with MS. So we also we have expert advice from uh, leading voices and then we also have real life experiences from people who live with MST. So in our episodes we hope that we'll be able to give you an in-depth insight into the impact that MS symptoms can have and how you can successfully manage them too. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how to be kind to our mind. So we call this episode Mind Matters, looking after your mental health with MS. And why this topic? Well, it's January uh, and it can be quite a heavy month for a lot of people. Uh, let's be honest now, the, the world is uh, kind of a tricky place at the moment. You just put the news on and uh, <laughs> it all feels a bit like doom and gloom and dread, dread at the moment. And then you add MS on top of that. So it can be a lot to deal with. So we wanted to dive into this topic a little bit better. Yeah, I know what you mean, Helena. It's, it's, it could be really difficult at the moment, can't it? Because, you know, everyone's just had the festive season as well. Mm. So, you know, already things are slightly more tricky just from, you know, coming into January, aren't they? And then there's lots of other things going on. Then you've got like pressure. Yeah. You know, maybe you've said... Uh, you know, this year I'm going to stop smoking, I'm going to change my diet, or whatever it is. Mm. So you put pressure on yourself and you get that like societal pressure as well that you should be conforming yeah. to these things, um, which, you know, like I always find quite difficult as well from whenever I've tried to do those, uh, you know, New Year's resolutions. It's like you go from absolutely eating all of all of the chocolate to yes. eating none of the chocolate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> really difficult. It's very much all or nothing, isn't it, in January? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And uh, yeah, we were really pleased uh, to talk to to Justin, mm. uh, Justin Stanfield, in our last episode. Uh, so Justin was a, a mindfulness teacher um, who lives with MS as well. Um, so it was really great to get his insight into, you know, how mindfulness can help in some of these stressful situations. Um, and today we, you know, we're moving on. It's slightly different, but also kind of building on that topic. Um, we're thinking about the mind. We're thinking about how to be kind to yourself, how to manage your mental health. Um, so this time we're going to try and tackle some real life uh, scenarios that some of you have told us about that cause you stress in your lives. Yeah, so we did a little call out on our social media channels um, and also our helpline team who you've been talking to uh, sort of reported back to, to us some of the more popular topics when it comes to sort of situations that you have to deal with. And that could be things like, you know, dealing with uh, getting an MS diagnosis or waiting for appointments and um, and all those sorts of things. So we, we had a, a bunch of responses and um, um, so, so that's what we came armed with for today's episodes yeah thank you so much to everyone who who did get in contact with us we really appreciate getting your your feedback and hearing your voice so with those uh, questions with those things that that are causing you stress we took them to professor derek willis and he's got some quite different approaches i think helena mm -hmm. is quite insightful isn't he um so we're really looking forward to hearing more from him and probably enough of hearing from myself. Uh, never, never tire from hearing from you, Helen. But, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, but we do have an interview to get to is what my point that I'm trying to make. <laughs> so without further ado, here is Helena with Professor Derek Willis. So we're New Year and we're in January and uh, we thought we would kick this year off by uh, talking a little bit about how to be kind to your mind. And with me today is Professor Derek Willis. Uh, would you mind just before we start talking about how to be kind to your mind, just telling everybody who, who you are and what it is you do? Hello, everybody. Um, my name's, as you've said, Professor Derek Willis. Thank you very much for spelling it right. That's that's fab, the very simple way of spelling Derek. So um, first of all, I'm a human being. 
I know that's really difficult to believe in a medical professional, but I'm a human being. So I'm a person, I'm a dad, I'm kind of partner, I love acting. So actually, I'm all these things, but at the same time, I have a job. Uh, my job is involved in looking after people who have illness that isn't going to get better. So my job isn't particular kind of MS per se, but I run a hospice um, within the Midlands. I train doctors, healthcare professionals on how to treat people who've got diseases where it's palliative um, and also teach ethics and communication skills. So a lot of my jobs involved in how do you get the best out of something where actually where it normally is better, like getting someone well? How do you get something out of that? How do, how do you um, keep yourself going with it? But also with, with patients themselves of, actually, we know that we're not going to get you better, but how do we keep you living your life? Because your life's not over. How do we keep giving you that life that you had? Albeit it might be different to how it was before you've ended up with this diagnosis. That's a very long introduction, isn't it? <laughs> My name's Derek. I'm a doctor. I talk a lot. Maybe that's just what you should start. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> no, I, I think you'll be the right person to talk to about this. So um, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world at the moment. Uh, we're recording this in December, I guess I should say, in case there's even more things going on when this goes out. Um, and there is a lot of stressful surroundings. So on top of having a condition like MS, how can we actually deal with everything that's going on when it's just coming down on us? Do you know what? I actually think there's nothing wrong with turning stuff off. Yeah. The, um, I was getting to work and I was like, why am I feeling so depressed before I even start? And it's like, well, because you drive into work and you have half an hour of the Today programme. I am that middle class. I listen to Radio 4. And then on the way home, you're listening to another half an hour of of, of gloom. Actually, there's, some, there's something about staying in contact with the world. But there's something with the fact that you can't do that reality the whole time. Mm. So actually, it's kind of fine to listen to Heart FM and sing 80s songs on the way back or stick a really rubbishy musical. So... The lens you see life through often reflects how your, your mood. So a news program is deliberately not going to ever tell you nice things, no. even though they have that, you know, that 30 seconds at the end where they tell you about a panda or, mm. you know, a dog that's been rescued. That kind of doesn't benefit all the wars, <laughs> violence. So I think stepping back from it is absolutely fine. Do you know what? I used to live in New Zealand. And one of the things that I used to think in New Zealand that was going to be absolutely awful was actually being on the periphery of things. And every week we would just listen to the today um, kind of summary of news. So we'd have an hour just so we kept in touch. And then that was it. And do you know what? We actually were much happier not knowing everything that went on because you just went, well, what am I actually going to do about it? What, mm. what difference does it actually make? And the answer is, I can't. It's just making me feel like this is the whole world. But do you know what? There's loads of kind people out there. There are really nice people out there. There are nice situations that happen. The world's still a beautiful place. And yeah, there's a lot of rubbish, but it's not exclusively the rubbish. And if all you do is listen to rubbish, that's all you're going to think that the rubbish that rubbish is there that it is so you know maybe just listen to a happy podcast and a happy netflix and stuff that's not quite so gloomy yeah i think i think you know when you listen to when you have social media on and you get all these bombardments of of, of too much things and too news flashes here and there i sometimes just go on to instagram and watch um um videos of pandas doing silly things or, or Do, you know what? Me, being a mad cat lady is absolutely fine because <laughs> yeah. watching mad cats just cheers you up doesn't it yeah. but actually if that just resets your head mm -hmm. yeah it's not going to rock anything is it but Actually, do you know what? That's for, and if there's if there's trashy novels that you read, I'm not going to say what my trashy novels are. Um, take a pick from all. Actually, it might not be Proust. It might not be the best writing ever. But if it's taking your brain to somewhere where you're kind of escaping from all this rubbish, mm -hmm. then actually it's fine. So find your your happy place, whatever it may be. 
and no judgment. And, <laughs> and don't apologise for being there because that happy place is a really important place to be. And that's just true for all of us because you're right. The immediacy of everything that mm. we have, you know, in the old days, it was a parchment and quill. So it was about two weeks before you found out what the bad yeah. news is. Now we're actually going in on the drones to see the do the bombs being dropped. Mm. That's that's unhealthy, isn't it? Yeah. watching news 24 hours a day and even having the news announcement on your phone so that mm. you know when something's bad happened just turn it off for a day or two yeah that's a good uh, and, and we could at least experiment see if you do turn it off and see does that make you feel happier then and, and what difference does it make exactly. if you do know that i don't know yeah no i guess that's the thing some you stars can't... died or you know we've invaded another country or what Another ex MPs come back who's retired. What difference is that no, going to make? <laughs> it's very true, isn't it? Because unless you're, I don't know, high high ranking politician or military person, it's not really going to be affecting you. Whatever these news comes in, so yeah. Um, this is a question that we get a lot at the moment because we all know the NHS is struggling a little bit. A lot of people are waiting very very long time for appointments. And while they're waiting, there's a lot of thoughts popping up in your head and anxiety and, and, and all sorts. How do we deal with that? Can we deal with that? <laughs> so it's the MS nurses in particular mm -hmm. that I teach. And they are incredibly good at helping people navigate the NHS. So what I would suggest is that you get in touch with your MS nurse to actually ask them, is what I've got something that you would expect from ms is it just something else it because you know we're still people we're still mm -hmm. humans you've got a diagnosis of ms but that doesn't stop you having a cold it doesn't stop you having a new and tract infection so um the the danger is that everything gets put down to that one disease so having someone at the end of the phone who tells you whether you need to be worried but actually knows the system to be able to navigate it and if you need brought forward actually they'll be able to reassure you and ask you to do that so i, I know for a fact how incredibly helpful those people are so i, I think if it's if it's you know these for people who've got a diagnosis of ms if you if you haven't got your ms nurse find out who they are and if you do have your ms nurse i'm sure that they would want you to phone them up or or email them rather than to be worrying mm. there, there was always a wait in the nhs there was yeah. again we are all listening to the news so you yeah. know that everything's awful and it's all coming yeah. apart but then they don't tell you all the bits that are working really yeah. well so all the extra weekend shifts that are people putting to to catch up on that actually it's specific surgery that's got, so yeah the nhs is bad but you only ever hear the bad news don't you and you don't hear the good news so just because you're waiting doesn't necessarily mean that everything's falling apart do you think that the anxiety over waiting with uh, appointments can actually be made worse from hearing news and reading about things like this i think ev even though there's a wait if there's mm. something urgent that will still be given weight yeah. So if the fact that you're waiting and everybody knows and the, the referral's not been missed, it generally suggests that it isn't something that really, really needs to be got kind of treated there and then. Because if it was, then everybody would be jumping up and down. And you're, as I say, your MS nurse is a good check and balance to make sure that it isn't one of those situations. Mm, that's very true. And I wouldn't be doing my job if I wouldn't say that if there are questions and you can't get the help, hold of your nurse, you could also give the MS Trust a, a call to, to see if they could maybe point you in the right direction as well. Um, we, we, you spoke a little bit at, at, in your introduction there about, um, you, you know, living with MS is a lifelong condition and it's, you know, not going to get better as such. When we are newly diagnosed with MS, there is an awful lot of uh, feelings that comes with that. I mean, some people even talk about going through uh, like a grieving process. Um, what's the best way to deal with it? I know it's, it, there's not really one size fit all with this, is there? <laughs> I, I think my, my opinion is on this, that the difficulty is that we cannot tell you what's going to happen. MS more than any other disease is either something that happens really, really occasionally and then things reverse and you've got a little bit less well than you were before, but actually that's minimal. 
or MS can be a disease which robs you fairly frequently of, of lots of things. And then there's all kinds of spectra in between. So when someone's diagnosed with MS, we can't tell you which one that, that is. Actually, some of this is just watching and waiting to see what happens. Mm. So for, for a lot of the people that I treat, they've got particular cancers. I can, I can tell you how this is going to play out. But with particular conditions, and I, I think that MS is one of them, where it ranges from mild to severe, we can't tell you which way this is going to go. Mm. And that, in my experience, is what people really, really struggle with, mm. of living with uncertainty. Living for today, but out without planning for your retirement, that doesn't make any sense. But mm. then you could go, well, what's the point of preparing for a pension? Because actually, I might not get there. But they're not preparing for that doesn't make any sense, does it? So yeah. so we do do a little bit of future planning and, and as if it's that. But to be constantly worrying about my retirement and not living now means that I miss out on the now. Yeah. I think when when I was diagnosed, my uh, well, boyfriend then, husband now, said to me... Congratulations. <laughs> he said to me, you, you, you could be run over by a bus tomorrow. And, you know, it wasn't kind of what I really wanted to hear just after being diagnosed with MS. But he was right in that way that, you know, that we don't have the control. And and my mum, she was very worried when I got when I got diagnosed and she was starting to ask things like, oh, should you really be living in a house with stairs? Should you be getting a bungalow? And, you know, this is now I'm 16 years later and I'm still walking far enough the stairs. You don't know. I could have. No, you don't. It could have been the opposite, but you don't know. And it's it's really a little bit pointless, I guess, to worry about what you don't know about, but it's hard not to. <laughs> but I mean, it, you know, I'm presuming that most of the people that listen to this are in the, in the West and in the West, we've got the illusion that we are in control mm. and, and we're not. Yeah. And a lot of cultures are much better at saying control is illusory, that actually what you do is live for today yeah. and you get, get what you're given and actually live with that and make a difference so of course we can make a difference to stuff but what we can make a difference to is very little yeah so but for example i my family are from the northeast and my history my, their cardiovascular history disease of heart disease is appalling i can do absolutely nothing about that and actually one of the biggest factors of whether you're going to have a heart attack or a stroke is what your family history is. Mm. But if I worry too much about that, then actually I wouldn't do anything. I wouldn't yeah. actually have any pie from Greg's ever. Um, but the little bit that I can make a difference to is that my family never exercised and they smoked. So I can do a bit there. Mm. But if I think too much about it, you go, well, actually, the amount of difference you make with the not smoking and, and exercising is probably fairly minimal. Um, there was a thing for doing genetic testing as well to work out what your risk of particular diseases is. You go, mm. well, why would you want to do that? Yeah. Because you can't actually do anything about it. And so I'd rather not know and live with it. So living with uncertainty, I say, is 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 a skill that we get from just living. But for folk who've been diagnosed with MS, there's a specific thing that you know that's going on. But that so that skill has to go for that particular disease. Mm. So I'm not I'm not underplaying it because I know that it's easy for me as someone who's outside of it. But I think we all get bereaved of a future that we thought that we were going to have that that isn't. Yeah. But then the bereavement is, well, you still don't really know how much you've lost because yeah. you look fab 16 years later from having MS, whereas probably from some of the conversations that people were having, you were going to be in a wheelchair having a stair lift and able to do anything. And look at you, you're doing technology that I can't even begin to understand. <laughs> Do you think working where you work that you you get more of a sort of embracing life because you see the end of life as in palliative care? So that there's a positive and a negative mm. of palliative care. The, the positive is that you never leave anything. Yeah. Because you just see so many people who've waited till they're retiring and they were going to do this, this and this. Mm. Um, my other half and I are rubbish at waiting. So it's like, right, if we want to do something, we're going to do it because yeah. you, you never know what's what's going to happen. Um, so you 
you try and learn from the lives of people that you've seen and those people that you're jealous of those people who've crammed so much in who've who've squeezed every ounce of life you just think you're amazing what a life well lived and actually this person dying we're sad but but actually there it was their time they'd done as much as they could with the life they'd got and then those people who had literally put everything off you go well you have been robbed because you've not had it so that's the good side. It kind of makes mm. you quite pro just just getting on with it. The downside is a little bit like I was talking with if all you're listening to is really depressing BBC news. Because I work with people who are end of life the whole day, there is a danger of thinking that that is what everybody is. Mm. And actually, do you know what? There's quite a lot of people that are living really well. And yes, everybody dies, but there's quite a lot of people who are well far away from, from having that. Yeah. So I have to make sure that I go to a gym where no one wants to talk about feelings, where all people want to do is to lift heavy things and grunt a lot and just do things where where people who are not going to want to talk about dying and mm. existential crises and things, because otherwise you just think that that's that's your entire world. And I know that's true from particular. So my friend works within um, the gum, so genitalia and redson, so sexual health. So she just sees all the really horrible stuff about sex, all the people that have got infections and things like mm. that, and that, that's her skewed view of it. But yeah. actually, do you know what? There's quite a few people in happy, stable relationships yeah. where, where nothing's gone wrong. It's, there's a lot of us out there. Yeah. So palliative medicine's brilliant for that, but you've just got to make sure that you, you look after yourself by making sure that your brain functions outside of, well, everybody's dying, aren't they? Well, yeah. yes, but no. Yeah. I'd love to do a, a podcast in the future about palliative care because I think there's so many misconceptions out there and people just sort of thinking that it's a place where you go to die, but clearly, clearly not. Well, most of our most of our work's in the community, keeping mm. people at home. Um, and most of the time, people don't want to come here. They kind of think it's like going to be the Adams family um, mm. place with tumbleweed going. Um and we have problems sending people home. The worst conversation I have is to say, well, we've done everything we were going to do, so it's time to move on. And then lots of folk are like, well, I want to stay. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, it is, but you don't need us anymore. Yeah. So. <laughs> um, we spoke a little bit about when you're newly diagnosed. This is something I know that can happen a lot to people who are newly diagnosed, but I think it really happens to 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 anyone with with not just MS but any condition. I, I think that there's a, a meme that goes around that says if you look into the mirror and say uh, chronic illness three times, somebody will pop up and say, "Have you tried yoga? Have you tried kale? Have you tried this?" <laughs> is there anything we can do with some of these? slightly annoying but well-meaning people i mean they can be family and friends you know that they might send send you a little news clipping of uh, here's a stem cell trial that's been done on on you know pigs could you sign up on that it's it can be a bit overwhelming but help help sometimes it's interesting isn't it um lots lots of people don't want to talk about my job because i remind them of stuff they don't want pinpointing so mm. either that's they don't want to think about dying or they've had a relative who's who's died and they don't want to go there i think if you've got a chronic illness and you can't get better you make other people feel helpless because we all want to do things that make people feel better that mm. make the situation better so you know the the classic thing of um my mum would make and it was mum because she's from the northeast she would make tomato soup and get ribena so whenever you were poorly you had tomato soup and ribena so that would rot your teeth but actually you would get better from it so people are really good at a doing thing to try yeah. and make you feel better so if you're chronically ill if there's a disease that we know that someone's not going to get better from and there's a disease that we misinterpret it because people's impression of ms are generally the worst people that are kind of ill um so they that would be that what you would look at so people think that that's um because you've got MS, you're going to be there. So you've got mm. to try and treat it. And, oh, my God, that's awful. What would happen if I had that? Mm. Yeah. So that's no excuse for it. But that saying the person that's trying to do it is just trying to be really helpful. Yeah. And rather than saying MS sounds really bad, tell me and just listening, mm. 
Hmm. which is probably what people need. They're trying to do to make things feel better. So, you know, Mr. Google and Mr. Infinite um, all kind of come into, come into play. So I guess one of the things to help with the irritating person is just to say, look, I know what you're trying to do is trying to help. And I really appreciate you trying to help. But what would really help me is if you either on the days that I'm having a really bad day, I could talk to you or you're my mate who takes me out to the pub or you're sophisticated. You might go to a wine bar. I don't know. Take me out for a drink and just talk about something apart from MS because mm. I just like to still remember that I'm still that person that does that. And our relationship has always been that. So that's what I need from you. Mm. Or, or again, just have a bit of a break. Yeah. <laughs> so, so being un, uncontactable is okay for a bit. Yeah. I think we're also, as the MS community, maybe if there's something that we feel really passionate about. So I, 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 I like running and I find running helpful. But it's not for everyone. It's, and it's not that everyone likes this, but I could sort of say, for me, this really worked, but I wouldn't. I, I think it's just that kind of sometimes you need to rein it in. And like you say, just be a listening ear. And also finding your moment. Mm. So when someone says, I don't want it to do, what do you think? Yeah. That's the moment where you could go, well, I, I've tried this and it really worked for me. Yeah. So there's a difference between I've tried this, this has really worked for me. Why don't you have a go? As opposed yeah. to this will work for yeah. you. And then if it doesn't, it's like, well, it worked for me. So there must be something wrong with you, which makes the person feel even worse, yeah. doesn't it? Of like, actually, I must be really rubbish because I don't know. Having having mistletoe or whatever didn't work for me. So it's not dissing those particular things, but you've just got to remember that some of this is the context of which system works for you. And if mm. you find that helpful, that's great. But that doesn't necessarily mean, mean you need to evangelize to someone to convert it. No, exactly. And MS is so different from person to person, isn't it? So even if if one person might yoga might work for some people. It, Will not work for everyone. So, like, <laughs> um, but on that note about what you're feeling, um, how can you explain your sort of mental state to others, or maybe when you want to ask for help um, to to get support that you need? Because that can also be a little bit hard to do. It's interesting, isn't it? I think I was guilty of trying to manipulate. Or, or change friendships where they were never really about feelings. They were always about doing stuff together that I kind of made a mistake of thinking that for those particular people that I could ever talk about how I was feeling about stuff. So if I've had a bad day, it takes a particular type of person to be able to cope with the fact that my, my regular job is incredibly weird. Mm. So there are, there are specific people I really value just because I do stuff with them and I never want to talk about what I do because actually they've just not got the machinery to be able to cope with it. Mm. But then there's a danger of actually you just shut down and think that nobody's interested. Yeah. Where there are particular people who actually you have got that form of relationship with. And sometimes that isn't necessarily the people you're related to, because some of the stuff you want to talk about, you feel would potentially hurt mm. that person. So sometimes people actually need professional help, where yeah. literally it is someone who you are seeing who for an hour, all you are doing is talking about yourself. And, the, and there's no relationship because actually you're not you're not talking to that person. But then I think all of us have got one or two people well, they kind of know all the good and the bad. Yeah. And you can actually go, right, all I need you to do is to shut up. I don't actually need advice. I just literally need to let it all out and tell you how it is. Yeah. I know some people who actually write that, that it's not the conversation that matters. It's them seeing what they've written. So they write it. Okay. And then they'll go away and then they'll come back and they'll read it back as being a different person the next day and go geez, I really, I was really in a bad place, wasn't I? But it's the, I think for a lot of people who find talking helpful, it's not particularly the person's answers. It's hearing yourself say stuff and crystallizing what you think, which is really important. 
Mm. So I've often said for the person that gives me um, support, my professional support, who where I have a kind of um, counselling session every month, I could just cut a cardboard cutout and put them there because actually what I'm doing is just I'm venting for an hour yeah. at that cardboard cutout. And they're very, they're very skilled, the person that I talk to who interjecting with a sentence every now and then. But yeah, I think so choose who it is so don't try and manipulate someone that's not going to be able to cope with that mm. into it and it might not be that it's your family and if there isn't anyone it might be that you do just need to find someone where it, it's literally a professional listening ear and what's the best way to go about getting a professional to, to, to listen to is it would you go to your gp to get referred to that or so some some of this is just about finding the person and the style that works for you. Mm. So so the good place is the GP because because and or just getting some idea of what qualifications to look out for. Yeah. Because you know people who've got no qualifications could set themselves up on the internet and say that I offer counselling and then yeah. you're paying someone who actually is effectively doing no more than your mate but having a pint of beer with you so yeah. it's it's worth just getting some idea of what professional bodies you need to look out for if you're a partner for perhaps or you're caring for someone with ms and you you're sort of dealing with the stress of looking after someone but also seeing somebody maybe being in pain um how do you deal with that gosh <laughs> so that's that's two things of how do you how do you self care mm. and how do you make sure that the person that you're caring for gets the help that they need yeah um so that's ensuring before that so the, i'll do the easy one first <laughs> which is the second one make make sure you know the phone numbers for the people that you should phone yeah. and um making sure that there's an identifiable person at the practice that actually knows what's going on so you're not mm. having to explain everything um and again, your MS nurse, the MS trust, if you're having problems with that, they're actually really helpful at kind of helping you um, identify who it is that's actually going to help you with the with the short term symptoms. And in that sense, it's kind of no different from what you would have if you've got something else going on with you medically. It's just it might be related to the MS. So you're hoping in the practice that there's someone that's got more of an idea about MS than other people do. How do you look after yourself? Mm -hmm. Now, where do you start with that? Because yeah. people have written PhDs. The first thing to say is you need to. Yeah. I think this is a really difficult question to answer. And one that me a culpa, I have to put my hands up going, I'm rubbish. Because in a sense, we're all carers, aren't we? Just mm -hmm. to a greater or less extent. We all, we all have those people who are dependent on us. And my brain works really well with sprints. I've got something and I'm going to sort it out. And then at the end of the 100 meters, it's it's over. So let's problem solve. As COVID showed me in a really bad way, I am not a marathon runner problem solver. And caring is a marathon run mm -hmm. because you, you're going to have to keep going. And what marathon runners are really good at is, is finding a rhythm to be able to do that. But sprinting and then pulling back sprinting and then pulling back so that's one way that they kind of find a way to get through that mm. so what um what i would suggest is that with with caring trying to go as if you've got a winning line to go to and you're going to finish it off isn't going to work because mm. you're going to get burnt out but knowing that you're going to have periods where actually you need to be more in, involved, but then periods where you back off a bit and maybe some of those periods where you back off a bit are sometimes when you do something for yourself. Yeah. Now, of course, it might be that you've got particular days that you have to be there all the time. But then when someone's ill, you might actually need to be there over and above that. But then other times you might actually be able to find some time to kind of rest for yourself. The other thing that I think is really important is that if you are caring, for you to be healthy means that you have to be healthy to be able to care. If you're mm. unhealthy, you cannot care. So it isn't just a, a selfish thing of, you know, um, self-care is used quite a lot by teenagers, mm. isn't it? Of like when you're actually asking them to do some a job in the house, I'm now doing self-care. So I think it's an overused phrase. But mm. I think from the point of view of people who are carers, that self-care is just about self-preservation yeah that 
this this is the thing that is going to go on you need to find a way to give yourself some energy and for your your life has meaning from the caring you give but your life has meaning from other things that you can actually do as well yeah i think that's really really important I, we quite often talk about whether we should uh, <laughs> learn from generation c because of this kind of actually thinking a little bit more about yourself and like you say it's not a selfish thing but actually self-care is a it's super important and yeah I, I don't know whether their definition of self-care is the one that i think <laughs> is really helpful because <laughs> like i say my experience of self-care is you can't possibly ask me to do anything it's like well if you're in the house i think you can actually contribute but what i think you're absolutely right is this this element that's saying look there's a psychological aspect mm. to, to things and maybe thinking about how mentally it affects you rather than just keeping going and never going oh do you yeah. know what's going on why am i feeling so tired well it's because six months you've kind of gone and have you actually done anything for you no i haven't so actually that's that's why you've got no energy left mm -hmm. and actually to have energy to keep going you've got to be able to to um pace yourself i guess is the word that i'm really after yeah but i like the analogy with with running a marathon because you you, you have people who are good at different distance and 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 you could there's no way you could run the sort of short distance sprint for a marathon unless you were potentially one of these very 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 fast marathon runners but and i mean you can only see my head and my hands as they flap around <laughs> i am not built to be a long distance runner i am very definitely mr sprinty um and psychologically, I think that's where I'm at as well. Here's a problem. Let's get it sorted. Yeah. Um, so this podcast is going out in January. Now, this is something we always hear about in January, and they debate whether it's a real thing or not. Um, Blue Monday, January blues. I mean, Blue Monday for me will be a, a, a song <laughs> rather than a... <laughs> Do you know what? Song. That's instantly where my head went. Yeah. One of the first 12 inches and it's such a brilliant song but, but but good music aside some people tend to get a little bit down in the dumps in january um and i mean is it a thing do we know okay it is? so if you're asking me scientifically has anyone ever proved it i think we're on a bit of dodgy ground yeah in my experience do i hate january absolutely yeah. um because you've had all that really exciting stuff for those of people who are on a wage, it's a long, you've had that early wage and then you've got a long time to wait mm. before your wage comes. And it's the worst weather of the year, isn't it? Yeah. So, and in a sense, there's nothing to look forward to in January. There's no bank holidays. There's, there's no. Yeah. So I actually, absolutely, I hate January. <laughs> I really loathe it. If, for me, it always feels like January has about 48 days, not 31. <laughs> just never ends but are there any tips or tricks to to get through january then so we tend to give ourselves nice things to do in january so it's i am sure everybody out there gets on with their relatives and loves them and christmas is not a time where it is you meet people that it's difficult so i'm sure that that's not true for everybody but we have friends who what we actually do is we have our staggered Christmas with them. And that's because a lot of our time is taken up with traveling and seeing people or sometimes we're actually abroad for the whole of Christmas. Then in January, we have our Christmases where we meet up with our friends. And part of that is because we've not met them over Christmas because it's family or you're traveling. But the other reason for that is just giving us some stuff that's just really nice to do during mm. January. So even if you're not Scottish, Burns Night is a brilliant thing to celebrate, just as a brilliant excuse to get people around. And haggises and neeps and tatties aren't really all that expensive. So it's not like a big prep thing. Um, and yeah, we that's when we tend to actually watch all the Christmas telly. Yeah. So we've kind of got it saved up. And then, oh, let's let's watch Christmas Doctor Who actually in January the 9th when it's rubbish. Um, so we'll save stuff up like that or the games that we bought. It's like, yeah. do you know what? We bought that. That was for Christmas Day. We were all too full and too tired out to be able to do it. Let's actually play that on, on you know, January the 12th. So I think staggering Christmas so it covers January 
and I think that was probably one of the ideas of it being 12 days of Christmas, wasn't it? Of actually you, you are in the middle of bleak midwinter. You've yeah. saved all these things up. They actually had 12 days where it kind of ended on January the 6th. So yeah. they kind of staggered it out. Um, and so keeping nice stuff going until January and spreading it over so it's not all in the one day, I kind of think works a bit better. I really like that because... I'm coming. I'm from Sweden, and we tend to sort of twenty days after Christmas. That's when the Christmas tree goes away. So I always found it strange when I moved here that you know, after um, sort of Boxing Day, off goes the tree, and I think, well, no, we want to keep the light and the coziness for as long as you can because January is a bleak, like you say, it's a horrible weather month. So a nice bit of cozy lights and things like that and it goes a long way for for, for this Swede, anyways. <laughs> yeah, and um, kind of. I've got Scottish roots. Christmas in Scotland is for the children. Mm. New Year and Hogmanay are for the adults. Yeah. So there's kind of a, a two thing that you kind of celebrate. Um, kind of down south, it's a bit weird that everything's invested in the one day. Yeah. So there's no wonder that everybody falls out because they're getting so stressed out to make this one day really work. Well, why don't you kind of have it 12 days? Yeah. And spread it over or actually have it on january the 31st where you celebrate you've got you've gone through the worst <laughs> i think yeah maybe we just need another celebration at the end of january instead we got through the month to celebrate find, find another bank holiday i'm sure yeah. there's a saint who died at the end of january we could exactly. kind of say it or well maybe we just need to make one well i like the idea of burns night because let's get to celebrate the scottish as well there's obviously a uk-wide podcast this so we're we're all up for the scottish people as well <laughs> yeah i like that yeah find something fun to do and then i guess everything you there's sales and all sorts of things if you do have any money saved after christmas i tend to <laughs> not have that but, <laughs> but again we, we spend so much money on the food for that one yeah. day what i'm not suggesting is spend the same amount no. actually we'll you know you end up having a tea that people half eat and then once you've decimated the turkey or whatever you have no one eats all of it so why don't you actually have your tea or supper or whatever you call it as your meal that you're going to have in two weeks time so you're spending money on that yeah but actually it's going to be really cheaper in the kind of post christmas sales to buy you know have a roast as a celebration on a sunday this is very um, true. I go and look for, for, for cheese and salmon and things like that, not normally quite down priced after Christmas. And... We, t we tend to actually have one of our holidays in January as well. We've got the joys of not having um, having kids school age. Yeah. And the one of the joys of that is that prices for holidays outside of school holidays are so cheaper. Yeah. So we'll actually have a long weekend away just to cheer ourselves up and it doesn't necessarily end up having to be any way far away it's just no. literally going somewhere nice with a big log fire and taking loads of books just kind of day trips to places that are more wintry fied is kind of quite nice i think anyway that's a great idea yes good lots of good ideas there I think. but yeah don't don't quote me in the british medical journal that <laughs> professor willis said that january january was um identify well people with seasonal affective disorder is mm. going to be really bad isn't it because the amount of sunlight we have it's very don't. true i like i like to think that apart we're, we're on the other side of the winter solstice so it is getting lighter so even if january is dark it is getting lighter a little bit every day <laughs> But uh, yes, thank you so much for chatting to me. This has been very, very interesting. And I like the idea of starting the new year with actually looking after our mind instead of rushing in to try new diets and change everything. Let's let's get this up here right first. That's a real pleasure. And it's been really nice speaking to you. Okay. More than happy to come back. Yes. And yeah, I'm really sorry for people who don't support in because this is just about to go out at Six Nations, isn't it? Um, <gasps> I've got blatant <laughs> England rugby players behind me. So, oh dear. Well, I, I hope that doesn't depress you too much if you're from one of the other absolutely. home nations. Yes, don't turn off if you're not a fan. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much, Dave. Now, if this was a commercial podcast, here is where you would expect to hear an advert. Uh, but as we're a charity, we don't do that. So instead, we'd like to take this opportunity in the middle of the podcast to tell you all about our fantastic resources that we have for people with MS. Yeah, so great place that you can start is our, our website. So that's mstrust.org.uk. And on there, we've got loads of information, lots of resources for anyone who's affected by MS. 
So as we're talking about well-being and MS today, um, you can find that section on our website. Stuff about sleep, mental health, relaxation, mindfulness, exercise, um, loads of support that you can get. So if you head to that website, that's mstrust.org.uk, and from there you can click on information and support, and there's a tab there called health and well-being. So don't worry, we'll also pop that link into the show notes too. So do click on that and and do go and check it out. Um, what did you uh, make of uh, Professor Derek Willis, Nick? Yeah, I really I really liked listening to him. I was jealous that you, you got to talk yeah. to, to Derek. I really liked um, when he was talking about actually just like just switching off from mm. it, just t- like removing yourself away from situations um you know and 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 finding the sort of the 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 sort of silliness and the the fun in life as well so you know singing along to music in your car and you know enjoying the things that you can enjoy as well when you are finding things difficult yeah i think it was very interesting to sort of hear just you know specifically from where what where he works sort of in palliative care that you sort of appreciate things that maybe we a lot of us just take for granted um and what he was saying about you know people putting things on hold uh because they're waiting for a, a great time to do something or you know it's 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 like they say there's never a perfect time to 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 have children you know <laughs> but it's like all these things that a lot of people uh, kind of do put on hold but then when you work in an environment like that you sort of see that sometimes you just have to try and live in the here and now. Now, I'm not saying that you all should go out there and and have children and buy houses and buy lottery tickets, but maybe just sort of appreciate uh, some situations um, that we are just all taking for granted. I think, you know, I just before we came on this recording today, it's a really cold day, um, but I decided to go out for a walk and it was just like, you know, you hear the the birds singing and then it's just kind of I don't know, a bit of sun on my face and just those little things actually that cheered me up and made me feel a bit more energized coming in here. And I did not have uh, any kind of news or anything like that playing because I think as of lately, you know, my telephone was just binging before Christmas going bing, 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 bing with all these news notifications. And, And although sometimes you do have to stay you know stay alert what's going on but a lot of the times it's not really relevant and 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 you probably could do with just like I don't know following it once a day like Derek was saying you know rather than we don't need all these you know instant things finding out all the time I think it's it's a lot of distraction and 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 a lot of kind of things that just brings us bring us down quite a lot yeah, completely. Completely, I completely agree. And like, yeah, I was jealous as well when you said you were going up for a nice walk and stuff. Why didn't I do that? I just yeah. sat around. <laughs> and it's such a little thing, isn't it? I yeah, think yeah. it made me think of my mum because my mum was like one of these people who she, she wasn't much for exercise or anything like that, but she loved being outside. And even when it was freezing cold, as if there was sun, she would like put on every jacket in the house and just go and sit in the garden with a cup of coffee. And that was like you know just a little me time for her and I, I feel like you know as a child I did not get it but now as an adult I definitely get that that is really really good for your mental health to do yeah for sure and I think like what you were saying about the distractions and the sort of constant um you know constant reminders from from particularly sort of news sources yeah um it's, you're right it's, it's just completely it's that like you know I get lots of those and um, they generally, you know, they're not bringing you good news, are they? Yeah. Um, but then I also, of course, I've, I've talked about this lots on the podcast before. Like, I will spend a lot of time doom scrolling mm. on social media, and like, so you're getting it from that angle as well. Yeah. That's like, you know, something. There's time in my day where I could be, uh, you know, doing something for myself or whatever. But you know, I'm, I'm also just scrolling through, and like like you said like you might be looking at nice things like pandas or something like that and that might yeah. be silly and that might help you um but for me personally sometimes i'll just end up reading like reading more about news stories yeah. or i'll be like go go down a rabbit hole of like stuff that's basically not good for me and like you know yeah, like, yeah. It's so amazing. yeah yeah 
I think the other thing that I really, really liked what he was saying when he was sort of explaining a little bit about, you know, because we always joke about the, the these the, like the meme about you, you look in the mirror and, and, and say chronic illness three times and somebody pops up and asks you to try kale or yoga or something like that. And I don't know, we all have well-meaning people in our lives that sometimes we'll, we'll sort of try things that, that, that you know, at, I remember when I was diagnosed, there were so many people going, try this diet, do this, do this. And 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 you feel so frustrated. But when he was sort of saying that actually it comes from, from a place of caring and also that people get reminded about their own sort of lives and, and, and things. It's like when somebody lives with a chronic condition, it's a scary thing for other people as well, because they kind of think about their own mortality and things, I suppose. Um, so, so maybe try and be a bit more more patient with these people, but then also maybe saying something like that, like instead instead of you know sending these things, which I appreciate that you, you you're trying to help me. Uh, maybe why don't we just go out for a coffee, or I'll drag you out for a walk in the <laughs> in the cold weather, and sort of be a little bit more patient because I think it's so easy to sort of sit and just go, oh, these people, but I suppose they are trying to be nice to you, uh, and. Everybody just, you know, it's it's that trickiness of of dealing with people who are struggling and 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 trying to be useful, I suppose. Yeah, and I, you know, I'm sure that I've done that to other people as well. Oh, I've read this thing. Have you? Do you want to try whatever it is? Mad yeah. kale yoga, whatever it is. Yeah. It? I'm sure we saw one the other day, didn't we? That was like moss milkshakes. Or oh something. Yes. I might have made that up. But yeah, but I'm sure I've done that to other people. Yeah um as well so you know i think it, it yeah and uh, yeah like you're saying it, it must come from a place of care because if people didn't care yeah they wouldn't say anything would they no, um, but no it was yeah it was really reassuring to actually he he kind he didn't almost sort of give you a script but it was almost like you know he gave you a good strategy of talking to those people as well yeah. and being like actually this is you know the, the example he said was like you know uh, you're my friend who we go to the pub with or we yeah. go to, you know we go to a cafe together I'd you know like I'd really love to just do that with you and just yeah. hang out you know if if yeah, I really appreciate you trying to help like um maybe we can do that and I, I thought that was you know that's quite a good way because quite easily and we see this online don't we in the, in the MS community all the time it's like someone will say have you tried this diet yeah. and like, people will come and say no we're not doing this you know, yeah, and yeah. Is, particularly online so it was quite a positive way of dealing with those people, I thought. Yeah, and hopefully kind of, and I think, you know, like you say, I've done it too. I, I'm always like, oh, can I fix, can I fix this problem? Can I yeah. fix this? Instead of actually just kind of going, do you know what? I'm not going to try and fix you. I'm just going to listen to what, what what's the problem instead. And because and, and, sometimes you just need a chat, don't you? Rather than actually having somebody supply you with a solution for something. Sometimes it's just nice to have a bit of a, a moan or, or 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 just sort of voice your concerns um and and just feel heard rather than somebody sort of going oh have you tried this and have you tried that because then you might feel a little bit belittled like of course i've tried this you know <laughs> yeah but, uh, yeah yeah think... like if if a, if a particular diet what like if eating kale cured ms yeah we would know about it wouldn't yeah, we? we would exactly. know that that was you know wouldn't be well, like you so, yeah. It. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. sorry i cut you off I don't know. Anyway, go ahead. <laughs> no but it but it's so true isn't it that, and i think you know there's always like new, new research and things popping up and and i feel like you know there's always people kind of giving you articles about oh have you seen this and have you seen that and especially when you work in the in the ms world i'm kind of like well if if i want I'm doing hopefully I'm doing my job so I'm keeping keeping uh, sort of on top of the research that's going on but 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 yeah I just have to sort of be a be maybe a little bit more patient with these people because it's coming from a nice point but then I thought another thing that was really interesting what he was saying when he came to himself and his work there that he sometimes needs the opposite so instead of people just talking things and talking about emotions and things he just wants to go to a gym and lift heavy things and you know where people who grunt rather than talk about emotions and sometimes I feel like it's really important to talk things through, but sometimes it is also just nice to be distracted by something else that's had nothing to do with whatever it is that's kind of churning in your mind. Yeah, I, I, I kind of saw it as, as like a bit of an escape, wasn't it? Yeah. 
but a healthy escape so yeah. like you going on your walk him going to the gym yeah you know and actually just getting away from it and just being in a situation where like that's not what you have to think about and I, I can imagine if you know everyone needs that don't they everyone needs you know everyone needs that so I guess keeping those ideas in your mind that whether it's the gym or or getting out or doing something that you enjoy that's healthy for you you know that that you're going to feel better about afterwards yeah I think it's really important especially when you wake up in the middle of the night and can't go back to sleep you know you're not going to be able to solve whatever problem it is at 2 a.m in the morning are you but then it's probably better to just I don't know think of those silly panda videos <laughs> or something that makes you happy rather than uh, trying to solve you know the world's problems um at that time um we are now two podcasts into the new year and the next one that's coming up we are going to be talking about something completely different we're going to be talking about bladder problems in ms yeah and if you do need to get in touch with us about something else too so if you've got questions about ms symptoms management diagnosis whether you live with someone with ms uh, we also have our helpline service as well so do get in contact with us we're open monday to friday apart from uk bank holidays and that's between 9 a.m to 5 p.m you can leave us a message as well outside of those times and we'll get back to you as soon as you can um, so you can call us that's 0800 or if you'd rather not talk to someone over the phone you can also email our helpline service as well so that's ask at mstrust.org.uk and we will of course link to that in the show notes as well um, and if you do happen to be on social media, so instead of doom scrolling, well, why don't you come and uh, give us a follow? Uh, we are on Facebook, we are on YouTube, X, TikTok and Instagram. Um, and you can find this podcast on Spotify, Google and Apple Podcast and Amazon Music. And the video is also up on YouTube. Uh, we would absolutely love it if you would comment on what you thought of this episode or any other episodes of uh, Breaking It Down. Um, reviews would be absolutely lovely if you would have the time to do that because we really would love to get more people to find the podcast to see it, um, you know to, to get in touch with more members of the MS community um, so I think I'm going to uh, turn this off now and um, uh, maybe go and, and, and put my um, I, I got one of those mindfulness apps after talking to, to Justin. So I might take a little uh, five minutes uh, downtime and, and try and see if I can calm myself down a little bit. Now. Good for you, Helena. That sounds good to me. <laughs> we'll see you next episode. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.